We're in a series here called Culture, and um, we started to talk about this several weeks ago, and the reality of the fact that when God gave Adam and Eve a mandate back in Genesis chapter 1, although uh, the mandate was a uh, concluded or, or capsulated in, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. It was a huge mandate. Then he said to them, he blessed them, and he told them to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish, to subdue and have dominion. And it was a huge responsibility. That actual responsibility was to actually go form society and to create culture. Now, the reason man was able to do that is because when we are introduced to God in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God, or Elohim. And we see God's very first introduction to us as a creator, as somebody who's got color and design and difference and uniqueness and all sorts of different stuff going on. And when it says in Genesis 1.26, God created man in his image and after his likeness, we too are creative creatures. And so God didn't give us the earth in its he gave it to us in its raw form and then he gave man the mandate to culture it or create and cultivate the thing. And so we saw within four chapters of the book of Genesis, they're already building cities, they're already doing agriculture, they're already doing manufacturing, they're already, I mean man is creative. And so man is a creative creature. Um, although man sinned, sin did not undo what, what man is. It, man's still a culture or and we are hardwired to do culture. And so sin didn't change man uh, from having the ability to culture, but it influenced him culturing. And so man, although he cultures, is culturing under the influence of sin. But uh, he still cultures. So we talked about culture, and we discovered that culture is broken down into sort of these fundamental truths. And that is this. When, when we do culture or society, we form families, uh, we do religion, we do government, education, business, media, and art. And again, they're all revealed in the first few chapters of Genesis. Of course, we all do family. Every one of us came from family. Everybody does religion. Now, even though people say I'm an atheist, it is a spiritual belief. It is a spiritual uh, uh, belief system. Um, but all humanity uh, knows that there's something else. It's intrinsically built within all humanity, Romans 1 tells us, that, that man knows there's a God. And so I put religion there because although people may not do Christianity as we know it, everybody's searching for um, the peace and resolve of what happens after death and that bigger being or that other entity that's up there. So we all do religion. I put it in red there because they, they're the things we do behind closed doors. That's sort of our private lives. But then the other one is where we integrate with other people in the world. We do government, we do education. Government because we organize ourselves and we keep law and order. Education because we want to pass a, a I spelled that wrong again. Um, a, I keep breaking them to around. Um, and uh, we do education to um, pass on our, uh, our information to the next generation. And we do business because we barter one with another and what you have in your skills I, I avail of. And we do media, we disseminate information uh, and knowledge and understanding and communication. And then we're all arty. We have all sorts of, we like color, we all have different variations of things that we like or don't like. And that what makes all of us you know, unique. But I put this as our public life and this is what's called the marketplace. Now we are all, given the cultural mandate. Every human being cultures, every human being, doesn't matter. You say, well, I'm a Christian. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or non-Christian. doesn't matter whether you're a Buddhist or a Muslim. It doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant. And you all culture. We culture because we're hardwired to culture. The thing about Christians is we've been given another uh, responsibility, and that is the Great Commission. And we've got to not confuse these. And we're supposed to fulfill the Great Commission as we culture. We're not doing the Great Commission as a different thing. And that's what happens with the church. We have this idea that because we are now doing the Great Commission that we have got to insulate, isolate, separate ourselves. And as I said in the earlier, um, in, in earlier uh, uh, lessons, we subculture. And so we've subcultured ourselves into a corner and we have our own language, we have our own books, we have our own... TV channels, we have, we've just subcultured, we've done the exact, we, we've done all of this stuff here in Christendom. And so we run out to the world, do our jobs, and then run back into Christendom, and, and we, we become ineffectual in the world in which we live. So we've got to get this thing right. 
we talked here about in Matthew chapter 6, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, it says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. These two particular uh, things we brought up. Let your light so shine before men. And so God wants us to, to be salt and light before men, not in separate from men. God wants us to be involved in, engaged in the marketplace. He wants us to be there. And that's where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be culturing, but we're supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission as we culture, not as a, as a separate thing. And so um, we are salt and we are light. We talked about this creative world, geographic world, and the social order. Remember, I, I, maybe some of you remember, I brought up this whole thing about love not the world, neither the things that are in that. Any man who loves the world is, a, is, is an enemy of God. And so Christians say, well, I don't want to be the enemy of God, and I don't want to love the world, so that's why I stay away from it. And you've got to understand what he means by world there. Is it the creative world? Because when God made the creative world, he said, it's good. And here's the deal. Sin can't undo what God said. God said the world that he created is good. Therefore, it's good. What the devil did was not more powerful than what God done. What the devil did affected man, but it didn't affect what God said was good. And the creative world that we see is good. In fact, the Bible says when man was put in it, it was very good. So when it says love not the world, is it the creative world? No. Is it the geographic world or the nations of the world? No, because God so loved the people that are in the nations and the geographic world uh, that he gave his only begotten son. So when the Bible says love not the world, he's not saying don't love the people, don't love the nations, because God loves them. So he's not a, you know, he's not schizophrenic uh, uh, in the Bible. He's the Lord God and he changes not. So when it says love not the world, he's not talking about the creative world. When it says love not the world, he's not talking about the geographic world and the people in it. But when it says love not the world, he's talking about the social order or what's going on in the culturing aspect of it, because it's been cultured under the influence of sin. And so it's not perfect, it's not the way it should be. And when the Bible talks in the book of Second Corinthians about Satan, he's called the God of, not the, not the creative world, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He doesn't own that, and he doesn't own the nations of the world. But he does influence the culturing that goes on because he sort of rules over man who's under sin and man hardwired to culture, cultures under that influence. So the system we have, although it's broken, people say, you know, they're always blaming God, you know, this is in the world and that's in the world. The reason things are in the world is because that's the way we've cultured it under sin. And so he tells us not to love the world. So we're not the light of the creative arrangement. And, and God's got the sun, moon, and stars for that. We're not the light of the geographic and national order. I'm not the light to America, neither are you. But we are light to the marketplace and the social order. And that's where we're supposed to let our light shine before men, in the workplace, uh, in, in the government, in creative art, in all of these aspects of where we do have this commonality where we culture. And if the church isolate, insulate, and separate themselves from it, then here's the deal. The people in the world will culture without us. They'll just go ahead and culture because that's what they do. And, and by separating ourselves from them, we just sort of let them culture, and then we sit around and complain about the big bad world that we're in and how it's you know, going down the tubes. And it's probably going down the tubes faster because we're not influencing it. Now, we're not going to change this world. Jesus is going to come back and change it. But we are here to influence it and let our light shine and do the Great Commission as we culture. So it's very, very important that we understand that. We talked about being spiritually distinct, but not socially segregated. We've got to be spiritually distinct. Yes, we're in the world. People say, well, if I go into the big bad world, listen, the big bad world is not as bad as you think it is. In fact, you're going to find out that God's already out there. God's, that's where God meets with us. People say, God's going to meet me in the church. No, actually, God will meet you in the marketplace because that's where he is. He's in the marketplace. And we'll show you that in, a, in, a, in another study in the weeks to come. But we have to be spiritually distinct, but not socially segregated. We have to be involved in the culture and in culturing the world in which we live in. And again, Jesus' final prayer in Gethsemane uh, before he went to the cross was this, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. 
He didn't pray for us to be insulated, isolated, separated from the culturing of the world in which we live. He told us, I'm sending you to it. They are not of the social order, even as I am not of that social order. That's what he was saying. But sanctify them through the word, that's truth, for the word is truth, as you have sent me into the social order or into that marketplace, even so I have also sent them into the world. And that's where Jesus did all of his ministry. Out of the 40 miracles that were performed in the Bible, um, all but one were performed in the marketplace. The only one that was performed in, in, uh, in the church, so to speak, was at the Gate Beautiful when Peter and John ministered to the guy as they were going into, in, into the synagogue that particular day. Jesus did all his ministry in the marketplace. He didn't do any of his ministry in the church. He never did. All of his ministry. I mean, if we're going to model ourselves like Jesus, if we're going to let Jesus be our example as the church, Jesus did all of his ministry in the marketplace. That's where he did it. That's where he went. Those are the people he spoke to. Um, and he, he drew from that particular market. I talked to you last week as we wound down, we talked about Jesus telling his disciples to go into the, the world and preach the, the, the gospel of the kingdom. And he gave us a, a model or an example of how to do that. He says, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray you therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that, you would, that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. You know, that's where we're supposed to be, in the harvest. Then he goes on to say, Go your way, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. All right, so it's, it's not the most comfortable place to be, but nonetheless, we are anointed to be there. And then he goes on to say, Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes, uh, nor, and salute no man in the way. Don't, don't sidetrack your, your intent or the purpose for your life. And then he goes into this. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And I brought this out last week, how that when we go, we are to go to be a blessing. So many Christians stand on a street corner with a loud hail or a placard or a sign, and they start to condemn and to judge and to criticize, and they become very condescending. And what happens is, uh, we put people off. And the Bible tells us that's not what we're supposed to do. We are here to be a blessing. The Bible actually tells us in the book of Acts that Jesus died and rose again uh, to bless me, and I become a blessing. As he said to Abraham, I'll bless you, and all the families of the world will be blessed through you. So we're here to be a blessing. And so that's why we go into and, and navigate the marketplaces to be a blessing. That's our intent, not to sort everybody out. Then he goes on in the same uh, passage and says, And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking, such as they give. And again, this eating and drinking and the whole concept and, and the intent here is to fellowship with people. Get to know people. Have lunch with them. Go have a cup of coffee. Talk to the people at work. I mean, instead of isolating yourself in the break and running down to some empty office somewhere so you can shun die for an hour while you have your hour break and call that spiritual, that's really not what he wants us to do. He wants us to go in the coffee room and sit with people and talk with people and get to know people and develop relationships and friendships with the people in which we do culture. So he says here, fellowship with them. Um, for the labor is worthy of his hire, uh, go not from house to house. Then he carries on and says, And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such as the uh, things that are set before you, and heal the sick. And again, healing the sick is one aspect of ministry, but there's all sorts of, what he's basically saying is minister to them. Um, uh, go to where they are, fellowship with them, develop relationships with them, and then minister to them. Now, if that means working alongside them or building the shed that they need to build that was knocked down because of the wind or cut their yard or bake a cake or make a, you know, do something, but get involved. Bless, minister, take your skill, your gift, whatever it is that you're graced with, and use it and say, hey, let me do that for you, or let me get involved in your life in some capacity. Or, hey, you know what, I'm good at math, or I'm good at whatever, and I can do accounts, and hey, let me do that for you. And you engage with them, and you start to minister to them, and then it says, 
Heal the sick that are therein, and then you say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. You know, preaching the kingdom and actually getting into the doctrine of the kingdom is not the first thing that we do, it's the last thing that we do. And we do it because we've involved ourselves, engaged ourselves, related ourselves to the people in the marketplace, and we earn the right to share the gospel with them. And so, you know, what, when you subculture, what we do is we, we live over here in our own little world and then we run out to their world and we tell them what they should be and shouldn't be and then we run back to our world. And that's what's wrong with us. We're not engaging the world correctly. And Jesus modeled for us how we're supposed to do that. I put this down because I love this portion of scripture here in the Message Bible because Paul talked about engaging the world because that's where Paul went. Paul engaged the marketplace. And so he says this, and I love it from the Message Bible. It says, for even though I am free of the demands and the expectations of everyone, he says, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. Or he basically said, I do everything I can to get out there where people are at and whatever it takes to get involved with them. I mean, if they like to fish, you know what, I fish too. You know, if they like to, to jog, you know what, I'll be a jogger or I'll do hiking or I'll, I'll get involved, for goodness sake. You know, some of the most uninteresting people on the planet are Christians. And the reason being is all they want to talk about is Jesus. And I don't know if you've ever met somebody and all they are just into it. And so every time you meet somebody and the opportunity comes, that's the conversation you're going to turn to. 16th and 17th century drawbridges. How many people do you think want to sit with you at the break and listen to you talk about 16th and 17th century drawbridges? Maybe one at the beginning, but I can get it when word gets out, nobody. You know why? They're not interested in 16th and 17th century drawbridges. Likewise, we're only interested in Jesus. We're only interested in heaven. We're only interested in God. And therefore, every time we sit down, first opportunity again, we can't have a civil conversation with anybody. We want to automatically go to the gospel and tell them how sinful they are and how needful they are of a savior. And they need to get born again and delivered from their sin and from the devils that possess them and blah, blah, blah. And before you know it, they don't want to sit with you at the break either. You know why? Because they're not interested. They're not interested. But you know what, if we would develop relationships and friendships and be all things to all men where possible, it's amazing how many people we would eventually earn the right to share the gospel with. And Jesus did the exact same. He went and sat down at the table. Most of Jesus' ministry was done at a table, by the way. Most of all of Jesus' ministry was done sitting around a table. Go look at it. Almost 90% of everything Jesus done was sitting around a meal. Almost all the time. Um, I'm doing a course here with, with some table leaders and we took this whole subject up, how most of Jesus' ministry was done sat around a meal. Why? Because that's where people gather, that's where people talk, that's where people feel safe, that's where people are invited, that's where people feel apart, that's where people integrate, and that's where Jesus met them. Sitting at a table having a meal somewhere. Instead of standing at, you know, with a loud hill at a corner somewhere and, and placards you know, condemning the world. That's not what he came to do. So, Paul says here, even though I am free from the demands and the expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily became the servant of all, and all, sorry, in order to reach a wide range of people. Religious. He came to, he, he can talk to the religious. And the non-religious. The meticulous moralists and loose living immoralists. The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearing in Christ. But he got involved with them. He said, well, we don't talk to this crowd. We don't talk to them. I would never go in there. I would never associate with whatever. Paul said, hey, I went to everybody. It didn't matter to me who they were. They weren't influencing me. I was there to influence them. So he says here, I, take on, I, I didn't take on their way of life, but I kept my bearing. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I become just about every sort of servant uh, there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did it all because of the message. I didn't just want to take or talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. I just love that version of it. 
Paul just basically said, I just went in, I just got involved. And that's the way we should be. We need to get involved in the marketplace. The world you can't enter is a world you can't win. And that's the reality of it. And if you stay aloof from it, you're just not going to win. And you say, well, I'm going to pray the Holy Ghost will send somebody or do something or shake Alpharetta. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is not going to shake Alpharetta. When God wants to do anything, God always sends a man. He always does. That's how he does everything. Anytime they prayed for a move of God or a revival or something to change, the first thing God done was he raised up a man and he sent them in. Or he had one born into that generation and he used that individual to do it. That's how God works. And yet we get so spooky and bizarre praying for, you know, God to do some spooky stuff in, in the city and, and do whatever. And the reality of it is, it's, it, he's not spooky, he's very real. I mean, God interacted and, and tabernacled with humanity and it didn't make him unholy. I mean, God was holy, Jesus was holy, and yet he mixed with the prostitutes and the sinners and the wine bibbers and the tax collectors. And you know what? It didn't make him unholy because they didn't influence him, but he did influence them. So, uh, Paul said this in Romans 1.14, I'm a debtor. Paul understood that. He said, I owe people this. I am a debtor to the Greek and to the barbarians, to the wise, to the unwise, and as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. And basically what Paul was saying is, look it, as a believer, I now have a debt. I owe it to my society. I owe it to my culture. I owe it to my workplace. I owe it to my colleagues. I owe it to my friends and neighbors. I owe it to them because I know something they don't know. So he says, I don't care whether they're educated or uneducated. I don't care if they're sophisticated or unsophisticated. I don't care if they're smart or stupid. I don't care if they're rich or poor. I don't care what color their skin is. I owe it to them to tell them. And here's the deal. I don't know everything, but as much as in me is, I have a story. I have a testimony. God did something for me. You say, well, you know, I, I'd love to go out and tell everybody at work, but I don't know where the verse is. You don't need to know where the verse is because you're not there to tell them the verse because the verse is not for them. The verse is for you and me to conform our life, to allow God to shine through our life. But our life is, 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 is an interaction of relationship with people, showing the love of God and the mercy and the compassion and the attitude and the thoughts and the intent, not quoting verses of scripture. So you say, well, I don't have a verse of scripture for everything. You don't need one. As much as in you is, share it with people. That's really what he was saying, and that's what Paul said. Churches need holy worldliness. Now, Augustine, the, 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 one of the fathers of faith way back in the uh, third century, Augustine was a tremendous theologian. And Augustine and others came up with this idealism, and they understood this back then, and that was that the church need holy worldliness. And here's what, what it is. It's not a worldliness that is unholy. See, the minute you mention worldliness, the church just go buck mad and they think, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not supposed to be worldly. Well, you are. You're supposed to engage culture. You're supposed to be a part of it. You're hardwired to do it. But when you do it, you're supposed to be holy. Again, you know, uh, spiritually distinct, but not segregated from the world that we live in. And so we need a worldliness that is, uh, uh, sorry, we need a worldliness that, sorry, not a worldliness that is unholy, neither a holiness that is unworldly. I mean, we're no good to the world if we're super holy and we build walls and we go in there and we take a vow of silence for the rest of our lives. I mean, God, there's no responsibility in that for goodness sake. You go back and think, well, I'm ever so holy because, you know, I've separated myself from everybody and I went behind closed doors and I built a monastery wall or something or a convent and I went in there or I went to a cave in the Himalayas and I spent the rest of my life humming to myself and, uh, you know, I, and, and, and God, I want God to use me. He can't use you back there, but he can use you in the workplace. He can use you as you sit at the boardroom and the board table. He can use you as you stand on the golf course and play a game of golf with a few friends. He can use you there. So we need not a worldliness that is unholy, but a holiness that is unworldly. Now, here's, here's the deal. Holiness is not a list of do's and do nots. See, that's what we often thought it was. When people say you're holy, say, well, you do do this and you don't do that. But here's the deal. There's more religious groups have done more do's and more do-nots than believers have. There's some people out there more religious than we are. 
There are some people out there and they live isolated, separated and insulated lives, doing their do's and not doing their don'ts, or whatever way that goes, and, and they do it more than we do. And so if holiness meant that you just do your do's and your do-nots, and that makes you holy, then I have to say there are people in the world that are holier than us. That's not what holiness is. Holiness is a lifestyle that is led, governed, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it holy. And it's the Holy Spirit that makes a life holy, not doing do's and not doing nots, or whatever it is, what did I say? Do nots, all right? That's not what holiness is. Holiness is, is being, this is what holiness, holiness is measured not by how much you would draw from the marketplace. That's not holiness. Well, we do do this and we don't do that. That's not holiness. Holiness is not measured by how much you would draw from the marketplace, but by how much your salt and light influence and affect it as you culture in it. That's holiness. How influential are you in it without being affected by it? You're in the world, but not of the world. And here's what we've done. The church hasn't trained its people to do this. We've trained our people because we didn't understand what was going on. We've trained our people that it's a big bad world out there, and the less you get to be involved in it, the less likely you are to be tempted, and the less likely you are to let God down, and so on and so forth. And then we have this ideal uh, idea of, of being away from it, and that was making me holy. So we don't go to our family's weddings because they have an open bar or because they have a this. And I've done it. We've done it in Ireland. I mean, when we were pioneering and starting off, I mean, we didn't know how to, we, we didn't know what we were doing. We just wanted to share the gospel. But we, I, was one of them that envisaged that holiness meant to insulate, isolate, and separate ourselves from the big bad world because we didn't understand it. It's why I teach it now, because I did the opposite to it. And so when somebody in the family was getting married, we refused to go to the wedding because, number one, it wasn't in, the, it wasn't in our church, it was in that church. Mm -hmm. And you can't go there because, you know, the Antichrist is coming from there. Mm -hmm. And all of these waffly things that we all thought when we got saved, and as well as that, they had a bar, and that meant people would get drunk. And if people got drunk, you don't want to be in that, you know, debauchery, and, and, and we're holy, and so we turned our families down and said, we're not going. Boy, how hurt our families were. How they thought we had really missed it. And you can understand their concern for us. And they were concerned for us. But we took that as persecution. Now, we were the ones persecuting them. Persecuting them with, with doctrines that were totally off the wall because we didn't understand. So we were the persecutors. They weren't persecuting us. They were just carrying on culturing. They did life as they knew best. We were the ones that was persecuting them. You learn through life. We made a lot of mistakes, but we learn from them. And this is why I teach this, because so many people don't understand um, how messed up the church can be when it comes to engaging the world in which we live and the purpose. And if you train people to do it, it's amazing how effectual we can be in the world. We can be the best businessmen and the best lawyers and the best doctors and we can be the best accountants, we can be the best business people, we can be the best teachers and the best athletes and the best singers and the best dancers and the best clothes designers. We can be the best in every arena of this world, developing relationships, loving God and living a life of the Great Commission in the midst of our culturing and that's where we're supposed to be. So. Um, I just put this down this morning, actually, when I, I just got up early and I was just praying. And I, I just put this um, sacred secular divide. We have this idea that if you're going to be holy, you've got to be in the ministry. If you're going to be used by God, you've got to be a, a preacher or a, somebody in full time ministry. And that's not true. And so we have this, uh, this sacred secular divide. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the sacred ministry and other people are in the secular and there's a divide between them and, and ministry is what I do but Jews don't do ministry. That's not, that's absolutely not. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 that the whole purpose of giving apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers was the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. 
The saints are in the ministry. Everybody that goes to work this morning, they're the ministers. Everybody that goes into a job, everybody that goes into a school, everybody that sits in a classroom this morning as a student, they are the ministers of the gospel. Not the people that are sitting on, are standing in the pulpit on a Sunday morning. And we have this holy, holier than thou a, a, a psyche where we think that we're the ones here that do the ministry and the people in the pew are not the ministers. It's totally at the opposite optic. And the Bible says it quite clearly, but we don't see it. He gave a, some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Hands up the saints. It's you guys. It's us, me too. The perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. We mature saints to do the ministry, and the whole purpose of the fivefold ministry is to prepare the saints to go to the world. That's our job. That's what we teach, or at least we should be teaching. So Jesus, Esther was a model. Esther was a model. If you go read the book of Esther, and God's not mentioned in the whole book, but Esther's a model. She's a, she's a glamour model. She's beautiful. She spends a whole year getting ready to be the queen after Queen Vashti uh, bailed out. She's, she's beautiful, she's gorgeous, and God uses her beauty to, to deliver the whole nation of Israel. Because if she hadn't been in that place at that time for such a time as this, the whole of Israel would have been totally wiped out. This lady was a model, and her beauty and she, she, she influenced the king not to kill all the, the Jews, the whole Jewish nation, which they were planning to do. This lady was a model. Um, Joseph, Joseph's family didn't recognize him. Did you know that when they came to meet him after they had sold him into slavery? Do you know why they didn't recognize him? I, I tried to find the picture that they had on the Discovery Channel of, of um, drawings that they have of what they believe to be Joseph. Uh, back in the days of Pharaoh and, and, uh, on, on some of the walls because that history is somewhat there about the famines. And the reason they didn't recognize their brother is because he looked like <coughs> an Egyptian. He looked like a Pharaoh. He had all the makeup, he had all the, the eyes done, he had the clothes, he had the garb, he had the name, he had the language, he had everything. They didn't recognize him. You know why they didn't recognize him? Because he didn't look like their brother, he looked like an Egyptian. But here he is, totally immersed in the culture of the Egyptians, but totally influenced the whole nation. Moses was trained in all the ways of the Egyptians. He had his PhD and his doctorate from such and such and whereabouts and whatever. I mean, the man was the most educated guy in the whole of the nation of Israel, because all they were were a pack of slaves. Every single one of them, all they could do is put brick and... And, and mud and, and straw together, that was the height of their skill set. This guy was an orator. This guy studied science, he studied architecture, he studied um, math, he studied physics. The guy was highly trained in all the ways of the Egyptians. This guy knew how to do culture and he was right in the middle of it. And God pulled him out of it and used him to deliver the children of Israel. David was a king, originally a shepherd, but he's in politics. And a lot of people that God used were all in politics because if you want to change the world, you can only change it from the marketplace. You cannot change the world from the church you go to. You can't do it from there. You have to get engaged in the marketplace to change the world you live in. And so Daniel, Daniel took it all, a Babylonian name and, and, and the whole Babylonian manner of, manner of life. Balthasar was his name. They didn't call him Daniel, they called him Balthasar. He spoke Babylonian. He went on to be the prime minister under the Babylonians and the Medo-Persian empires. He was a politician and a brilliant one at that. A brilliant politician. Influenced by God and he influenced the dynasties of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persian empires under several kings. Politician. Totally immersed in the language and the culture and the dress and the lifestyle. You know, you look at some people in religions today and they dress a certain way and you can tell them a mile away because they're different. And they, they say, well, you know what, I'm dressing a certain way because it's holy. God wants us to fit in with the culture that we live in. God wants us to have the style. God wants us to live in nice places, have nice things, and, and infiltrate and integrate into the world where we are at. 
and, and uh, whatever. And so Jesus, he was a carpenter's kid. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Elisha was a farmer. Uh, Peter was a fisherman. Luke was a doctor. I mean, they came, and every one that Jesus picked, every single one of them came from the marketplace. Not one of them came out of a synagogue. Did you know that? Jesus didn't recruit anybody from the synagogue. He never went near them. In fact, he didn't like them. He loved them, but he didn't like them. He didn't love them, not like them. He, he didn't like, he called them hypocrites and whitewashed applicers and, and the whole lot. But let me tell you, Jesus drew his crew from the marketplace and then sent them right back into it because they knew how to do life and culture among the people. And so that's what he'd done. So, here's the way it works. Our first priority is not to save the lost. That's not... That, that's, that's not our priority. Our first priority is not to save the lost, but to live a life before them that they admire. That's really what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to get in and live a life before them, and, and then we'll earn the right to share the gospel with them and see them saved. And this is really the, the way it should be. Our vertical relationship with God should be so strong that our horizontal relationship in the marketplace becomes influential. That's just the way it is. But again, this idea that, well, we're only here to see them saved, it, it gives us an excuse not to integrate. It gives us an excuse not to be involved. It gives us an excuse not to mix and mingle. No, we're supposed to mix and mingle. Now, when I say it's not the priority, we want to see people saved, so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But this idea that, you know, well, we can get them saved by sharing the gospel with them from a loud hailer. We can get them saved, you know, by printing it in, uh, on, on the bumper sticker on the car or get a plane to fly over Alpharetta every so often and tell them all that they need to be born again. I mean, that's awesome. But that's, you know, here's what we do, really. You say, well, we don't do that. No, but here's what we do do. We get an evangelist and we throw money in his kitty and tell him, you go off out there and win the world and you get the... The, the auditoriums and whatever, and we'll support you. Mean, in the meantime, we'll just get off and enjoy ourselves and enjoy our toys and enjoy our stuff, and we'll throw a few bob in your kitty every week, and you make sure you go out and win the world for us. That's our evangelical thrust. We want to see the world saved. No, we're meant to go live a life before them that they'll admire. So let me sh show you a few of these. In Titus chapter 2, in the epistles, it says... But thou speak, sorry, but speak thou these things uh, that become sound doctrine. That the aged men, I know that's none of us here, we're not there yet, but it's for people older than that, all right? But for the aged men, again, to be sober, to be grave, to be temperate, to be sound in faith and in love and in patience. And again, he's talking about, to the older men that they're to live a life of sobriety. They're to live a life of control. They're to live a life of respect and honoring they're, they're in their older age and, and, and whatever, they're to live a life that is very controlled and understood and respected. Live a respectful life. Now he's talking about not living it in the church. He's talking about living it in the world. He's going to say that in a minute. Then he goes on to say, and the aged women, likewise. Now he's talking to them. It says that they be, a, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers or gossips or whatever, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Now he's talking to the older women, that they should be an example to the younger women that are there. That they teach the younger women, now he's addressing them, to be sober, to love their husbands and to love their children. To be discreet and chaste and keepers at home, good and obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Notice, all these people have been admonished to live life a certain way so that people who watch them will not look down on the gospel that they preach or the gospel they believe. So he says their lifestyle has everything got to do with people's idea of the word that they live and the word that they believe. And it's not their preaching, it's their living it that matters. Older men, or older women, younger women. And then he says... Uh, again, in verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Why? 
that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, have, have, having no evil to say of you. He didn't say go out and, and, and preach the gospel to them. He said go out and live the gospel before them. Whether you're older man, an older woman, a younger woman, a younger man, he said live the life, live a life before them so that they can't criticize what it is you believe and who it is you are. But he didn't say preach to them, he said live it before them. Live it before them. And it gives credibility to the message that you preach. You say, well, I go to a certain church and we give so much money or we do such and we do whatever. No, 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 listen. Show it by the social life that you live, whether you be an older man or an older woman, whether you be a grandparent or whether you be a husband or a wife or a single man or a single girl. Show people your doctrine by the way that you live, not by the words that you speak alone. And this is what he's telling them. And this is the reason he tells them to live this life and culture among society. Show a life worth living and others will desire to follow. If you show a life, that's what's wrong with us. We haven't been a good advert for the message that we preach. If we would be a better advertisement for the message that we preach, you know, I mean, if you drive BMW, uh, if you, you're in a BMW work, uh, uh, showroom and you tell everybody that, you know, BMW is the best car in the world, you can't get any better than BMW, you can't get any better than that, and then they watch you leave the workplace and you get out and you go into a Toyota. So what did you buy? I bought a Toyota. Well, why didn't you buy a BMW? So, well, you know, I, I don't really believe now what you just said because what you're living out is different than what you're telling me. You're telling me BMW is the best and I should buy one, but you're driving a Toyota, for goodness sake. You're telling me that I'm supposed to get saved and, win, and be good and holy and righteous and good and godly and used to having a civil word to say to one another. No, live it before me and then I'll believe it. Show me a life worth living and then I'll desire to follow it. And this is the responsibility that's upon the people in the church. This is what church is to do. Prepare us to live this life. Uh, Titus 2.9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters. Servants here, let's just put that as employees really. It says, exhort employees to be obedient to their masters. This is the workplace, this is the marketplace. And to please them well in all things, not answering again or causing trouble. It goes on to say, not purloining, fancy old English word, which means pilfering, taking their pens and their pencils and their little bits and pieces from the place and say, well, they have enough of them, they can afford that, I'll just take, they won't miss it. He says, stop doing that. Stop taking their stuff, for goodness sake. Work for them. He said, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity Watch, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So, he says, tell the employees to live out the doctrine where? In the marketplace. He tells them that's what they're supposed to do. That's where they're supposed to be the Christian, in the marketplace, wherever they were. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying on godliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the monastery. I mean, in the convent. I mean, in the cave. I mean, in our church and our church subculture. He didn't say that. He said, we're supposed to live this life righteously and godly in the marketplace. That's where we do life. Or he says this, again, I just put it down in the Amplified, uh, tell bond servants to be submissive to the masters, to be pleasing, and to give satisfaction in every way. <clears throat> Warn them not to talk back or contradict, nor to steal by taking things of small value, but to prove themselves truly loyal and entirely reliable and faithful throughout. So, that in everything they may be an ornament to do credit to the teaching which is from and about God our Savior. This is, these are the epistles. This is, what they're, this is what the epistles are teaching us. Not to, you know, condemn this, that, that lifestyle or that life. He says, get involved. Go out to work. Get in the marketplace. If you're an employee, go out there and live the life in front of your employer. 
Why? So that he'll see you as an ornament of the teaching which is from and about God. That's where we do it. We live a life, we work it out in the marketplace. A picture is better than a thousand words, is it not? Well, so they say. So they say. You put the right picture up there and you can stand for ages talking about what it means or what they see or what you see in it. And people see different things from it. I mean, it's amazing what you see in a picture. And likewise, your life is that picture. You live out the gospel in the marketplace. Philippians 2.14 says this. It says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure. Watch. Children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. And this is separate from it. He said right in the middle of it. He said, live this life right, blameless and pure, but live it right in the middle of, the, of this twisted generation. Then you will show, or sorry, then you, sorry, I'm so sorry. Then you will shine among them. This is where your light shines, among them, like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly the word of life. This, that's the New International Version. Let me read that same thing to you from the Message Bible, and then I'll take it through into the verses that come after it. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in the squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry that life-giving message into their night. Wonderful explanation. But that's what we do with it. That's where we go with it. Then he goes on in the, uh, it says, uh, it, can I read the same one? Let me, let me do this. Sorry, this is the one I carry on with. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of the day he visits us. Message Bible, now I bring this one through. It says, live an exemplary life among the natives and uh, sorry, so that your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they'll be won over to God's side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. I mean, how clear is that? We don't teach this stuff, really. We, we teach all sorts of stuff. How, you know, the word does this for you and the word will do that for you. And if you play this word and sow this seed and do that. And here we have this introvert, optic on the Word of God that, you know, we subculture and we only use the Word of God to give us a better lifestyle as we wait for the extraction. And we take all the responsibility of getting involved in the world in which we live, living a life in front of them. He goes on in the Message Bible to say, make the Master proud of you by living, by, sorry, by being good citizens. Respect the authorities, whatever their level. They are God's emissaries for keeping order. It is God's will that by doing good, you might cure the ignorance of the fool who think you're a danger to society. You know, most people you know, don't get involved with us and they stay away from us because any encounter they've had many times with Christians normally isn't a good one. There are certain people, you know, with certain issues and problems in life, and, and the last people they want to see is a believer, because the minute you turn around and say, I'm a Christian, they go, oh, yeah, and they roll their eyes up, and they automatically have a negative view of us. And more often than not, it's because they don't really know us. And another thing is we don't understand that we're supposed to live life with them and show compassion and mercy and understanding and so on and so forth. But in the marketplace, preach the gospel constantly. You've heard this before. And if necessary, use words, St. Francis of Assisi. We're supposed to preach the gospel all the time. But if you need to use words, then go ahead and use words. But that's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly the same revelation that he got from the scriptures. We're supposed to live a life in the marketplace. 1 Timothy 4.11 These things command and teach. Let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, or your manner of life, in your manner of love, in your attitude, in your faithfulness, and in your purity. 
That's where we do it. We're an example. But we haven't taught Christians to be an example. So we think we can, you know, we put on our, our cliches when we go to church, praise the Lord, thank you Jesus, hallelujah. And we do all our stuff on, on our one hour out of the 168 hours we have in a week. We spend one hour and we give that to God and we spend the other 167 hours then. In fact, we, are, we have so pigeonholed God that if, if, we, if your service is over an hour, in fact, we go there for the one hour to get ready to live the other 167 hours in the world. That's where it is. So, let me close with this, if I may. Uh, actually, this is another one. It says, take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing, doing your doctrine, not speaking your doctrine, not proclaiming your doctrine, but in the doing of it, you shall both save yourself and other ones that hear your manner of life and hear what you have to say. It's, it's by living it that it, it, it has the impact. I thought I was coming to this, but I didn't. Whatsoever you do, work at it, as with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for your human master. Do it for God. When you go to work, you go to work for God. You say, well, I work for so-and-so, or I work for AT&T, or I work for Chick-fil-A, or I work for... No, you don't. You're employed by them, but you really work. The word there, the word work in the Bible means to be self, become self. That's what the word... When the Bible says, God give Adam work, the word there, work, is to become. You think work is doing chores. That's not work. The word work in the Bible is to become. In other words, I made you, now become you. Become what you are. We're employed by people, but we work. We become ourselves with and for God. Anyway, we leave it there for today. I'll try and lift up on it next week, and we'll talk about Paul in the middle of Athens, in Mars Hill, in the uh, Areopagus, meeting with all the philosophers and the uh, thinkers of that generation. And his message to them is phenomenal. What a phenomenal message that man preached on Mars Hill that day. And uh, we can learn so much from Paul's attitude toward the thinkers and the, um, and the society of that time. Anyway, let's pray and we'll, we'll close. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful time together. Thank you for the Word of God. I pray, Lord, as we study this series on culture, we'll find, uh, Lord, uh, instruction um, as to what you desire from us and what you desire to do to us and what you would love to do through us. In Jesus' name.